stacks and queues to basic data structures that you will probably come across if you are a computer science student. What we're going to do today is we're going to take a closer look at both these things and well, I guess we'll go a little bit further than our usual videos. First, I will of course give you an overall look at these data structures, but for this episode, we're also going to go further to look at some slightly more in-depth implementation. So yeah, stacks and cues. You're watching another Random Wednesday episode on 0612 TV. Hello and welcome to another Random Wednesday episode. So, stacks and queues, what exactly are they and what purpose do they serve? Now, let's say you want to store a group of multiple items. Obviously, well, the straightforward solution you are looking for would probably be an array. An array can let you do a lot of things, it is essentially just a string of connected spaces that, well, you can basically do whatever you like with it. Essentially, at the base of things, stacks and queues are just arrays. However, the array is hidden behind some fancy code. Because of that, you cannot actually directly manipulate the contents of the array. Instead, you have to use a number of special functions. What functions? Well, we'll go into those as we move along. Now, one more thing before we jump into the actual implementation. Stacks and queues are actually based on some real-world equivalent. A stack is like a stack of papers, whereas a queue is like, well, any old queue. So as we actually move forward to discuss these two data structures, keep the picture of the real world equivalent in mind. It will really help in your understanding of these data structures. So all right, without further ado, let us jump in to take a look at stacks. So stacks, let us begin by actually painting a picture. Now, say you have a stack of papers on your desk. What is the easiest way to work with a stack of papers without actually toppling it over or messing it up? Well, you can just work with the topmost item. What this means is if I want to add new pieces of paper to the stack, obviously I would do so by putting them at the top. And if I want to actually look for something in a stack, I start from the top. I start removing items until I find whatever I want. Essentially, that is the behavior of a stack data structure. A stack data structure lets you do two things, a push or a pop. It's extremely simple. Pushing means adding a new item to the stack. So you simply push it onto the top of the stack. So visually, push operations essentially look like this. I'm adding more and more items to the top of the stack. The other operation is pop, and pop means removing the topmost item. For the couple of items we've pushed onto the stack, we can simply pop them up and they'll come up in this particular order. This behavior is the reason why people call the stack a lethal structure, or a last-in, first-out structure. Why do we call it that? Well, simply because the last thing we push onto the stack is the first thing we pop out of it. Therefore, we call it last-in, first-out. So how is this implemented? Well, essentially, you have your array. Of course, you will need your array to hold multiple items, and we need one more variable to keep track of where the top of the stack is. I'm going to draw this as an arrow. Essentially, that's the whole point of this particular variable. It is to actually point you to wherever the top of the stack is. So push and pop operations will work something like this. When you want to push an item onto the stack, look at which square the pointer is actually pointing to and put the item there. Now that the top of the stack has changed, you want to actually move the pointer so that it points to the next empty space. For popping, all you have to do is to bring the pointer down by one and take out that element. So that's all well and good. I hope you have no issues understanding this. Now, we want to look out for a number of pitfalls. Let's say now your array is only of size n and it's already full. When you want to push a new item onto this stack, well, you are going to get some weird error because of course, you have exceeded the bounds of the array. So that is one thing you want to look out for. If your pointer is pointing at a spot outside of your array, well, don't allow the user to push any more new items on that. Similarly, you shouldn't be popping when your array is empty. If your pointer is pointing at element zero, in other words, basically the bottom of the stack, that indicates that a stack is empty and you should throw an error if the user tries to pop from the stack. And essentially that's it. Those are all the things you have to take into account 
when you want to build a stack data structure. So that's that. Let us now move on to a queue. Once again, let's begin by painting a picture. Well, imagine you have just a queue of people. Essentially, we identify the front of the queue and the back of the queue. Every time someone wants to join the queue, they must of course come in from the back. And of course, whatever it is they are queuing for, when it is ready to serve the next person, well, the frontmost person leaves. That is essentially what we are doing with the queue structure. New elements must come in from the back, and whenever you want to remove an element, you must remove it from the front. That's why it's called a FIFO data structure, or first in, first out. Obviously, that's how a queue works. The guy who comes first must be the guy who gets served first. Otherwise, well, your queue isn't working right. The two operations that can be done on a queue are called NQ and DQ. Of course, these names are probably slightly easier to understand than push and pop. NQ just means, well, putting someone into the queue, and DQ means taking someone out of the queue. Now, depending on where you're learning about queues, you might hear some of the slightly older terms being used. In fact, instead of NQ and DQ, you can also use poll and offer. Offer means NQ and poll means DQ. Now, I'm not going to use the terms offer and poll since it is slightly less intuitive in terms of their meaning. I guess they do deserve a mention here in case you come across those terms. So alright, let us now take a look at how we're going to actually implement a queue. Now, this is slightly more complicated than a stack. For a stack, we only need to take into account one thing, and that is the top of the stack. The reason for that is because, well, adding someone or removing someone all happens from the same place. But that's not a case for a queue. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by actually looking at a naive implementation of a queue and discussing why that's a bad idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use just one pointer for now to keep track of the back of the queue. The front of the queue is just the front of the array. So what's going to happen is, well, I'm going to add a couple of numbers into this queue. And well, as it is intuitive, every time I add something to the queue, I move the pointer back. Now, that's all well and good. But what happens when I want the DQ? So I DQ by removing someone from the front of the array. This creates a little gap. What do I do next? The naive implementation will tell me to basically shift everything forwards, but notice how that's not a very practical solution. If I had a queue that was very huge and quite well populated, notice how this creates quite a huge problem. Every time I want to remove someone from the queue, what I'm going to have to do is I'm actually going to have to go through the entire array and move everyone forward. And well, that's less than ideal. The way to fix this is to actually keep track of both the front and the back of the queue. So let's see this in action. Essentially, I have my queue here and I've enqueued several people. So now my front pointer is all the way in front and my back pointer is at the back. When I perform a DQ operation, well, that's simple. I simply remove the person indicated by the front pointer and move the front pointer one position back. That way, I don't actually have to shimmy everyone forwards. Similarly, when I want to enqueue someone, all I have to do is to add them to the box that a back pointer is pointing at and to move the back pointer one position back. Now, that's all well and good, except now, you realize that I'll run out of space very quickly. What am I supposed to do when my array looks like this? My back pointer has hit the very end of the array, but really, I've got lots of free space at the front of the array. Essentially, you can actually allow your back pointer to wrap over to the front of the array. So here's what it looks like visually. As I add more people to this particular queue, the back pointer actually jumps over to the front of the array. In other words, we can actually have our back pointer to the left of the front pointer. And whenever we have such a condition, we will be able to identify the fact that we've actually gone wrong. What this means is we have to take care of this as well when we are moving either pointer backwards. This isn't very difficult as long as we use the modulo function. Let's take a look at how this works. The modulo function essentially means the remainder of a division. So now let's say I have an array of size 5 and I've got a pointer here that I want to increment and as a result of that actually push it back to the front of the array. This is a zero indexed array, so essentially this pointer is pointing at position four. Now, what happens when I add one to it? Well, its value becomes five. However, instead of just taking this value, 
I take the modulo of 5. And what this means is I'm going to take this value, I'm going to divide it by 5, and I'm going to look at the remainder. In this case, the remainder is actually 0, because of course, 5 divides by 5 cleanly without any remainder. This pushes the pointer all the way back to the left. And that is essentially the method used to, well, keep your pointer circulating within the array. It is also important to note that this will not break when, well, your pointer is pointing at any of the other boxes. Let's say now the pointer is at position 1, and I increment it, and I turn it into 2. Now, the rest of this line tells us that, okay, I'm going to take 2, and I'm going to divide it by 5. The result is going to be the remainder. However, the result of the division is 0, because, well, it's not possible to split 2 items by 5. In other words, the final answer of this entire calculation is still 2, and that's why the position remains valid. So alright, we are very near the end here. Now, remember that when we were dealing with stacks, we had to look out for, well, either an empty stack or a full stack. The same applies here, except because we are using a circular array, well, the way we do it is slightly different. First, how do we tell if the queue is entirely full? Thankfully, we can just look at our front and back pointers and they'll tell us. Notice how our back pointer always points at the next blank slot, whereas of course the front pointer just keeps track of the frontmost item. In other words, if there are no blank spots at the end of the queue now, what this means is the front and the back pointer should point to the same element. However, there is still a little bit of confusion in this case, because what happens if our queue is empty? If our queue is entirely empty, well, your front and back pointer also point to the same item. So how do we solve this confusion? This is one of the weird little things of having a circular queue that we need to look out for. The simplest way to do this would be to actually leave a gap between the front and back pointers. What this means then is that instead of having this as our array full condition, instead we make this our array full condition. In other words, a queue is full if the back pointer is directly left of the front pointer. Then we will be able to tell the difference between when a queue is entirely empty and when the queue is full. Because now, when a queue is full, the two pointers are just side by side. Whereas, if the queue is entirely empty, that is the only situation where the two pointers are actually pointing to the same square. And there you go! This episode has run a little bit long, but I still feel it's important to quickly summarize this entire episode, so let us do just that. So for a stack, we can only interact with the topmost element, and we can make use of two functions called push and pop. We keep track of where the top of the stack is by using a single pointer. It will always point to the topmost free block. The two error conditions are when I try to push to a stack when it's full, or when I try to pop from a stack when it's empty. And essentially a stack is full if the pointer is pointing outside the array, and a stack is empty if the pointer is all the way at the bottom. Simple as that. And moving on to a queue, essentially we have two operations, and queue and the queue. And the queue adds people to the back of the queue, whereas the queue removes people from the front of the queue. To implement this, we need both a front and a back pointer. The two error conditions are if we try to enqueue something when the queue is full, or when we try to dequeue something when the queue is empty. To check for either of these conditions, a queue is full if the back pointer is directly left of the front pointer, whereas the queue is empty if the front and back pointers are pointing to the same element. And there you have it! That is it. That is a stack and a queue. I am sorry it took a little bit too long to explain this, but hopefully it was useful. So yeah, I hope you learned something today. If you are not sure about anything, do leave a comment. I will, of course, do my best to reply to you. Anyway, that wraps it up for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Hello, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget I appreciate every like, favorite, and comment you give me. If you'd like to see more from me in the future, don't forget to subscribe. For more updates outside of YouTube, do follow my official Twitter account at 0612TV. And if you'd like to see more of my work, you can also check out my About Me page. Once again, thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612TV.